Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Heart Talk HR. I'm your host, Mihai Nagy. My guest today is Dr. Richard Clayden. Richard is an organizational misbehaviorist who's helping companies to deal with ambiguity in today's VUCA world. And of course, probably you will agree that we are experiencing the biggest VUCA moment in our life with the current pandemic sweeping around the world. So we are talking about today how to deal with paradox, how to navigate ambiguity, and how to effectively deliver on long-term objectives while dealing with short-term pressures. I hope you will enjoy today's episode, and if you do, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. At Heart Talk HR, we bring you fresh ideas and inspiring content from around the world of work. So Richard, good afternoon. You are in Hong Kong. I'm in Budapest. It's such a delight, such a privilege having you on the show. And I mentioned during my introduction that today the big, the, the focus of our discussion is about the ability to manage paradox, navigate paradox in today's such an uncertain, ambiguous time. And on your LinkedIn profile, I nicked this from your LinkedIn profile, Today's lead, today leaders worry about black swans. They spend a lot of time dealing with the volatility and uncertainty in the world. Correct me if I'm wrong, this sentence was written before coronavirus pandemic hit. But since then, now we have a new term from VUCA, we have a new term for ambiguity in organizations. So leaders are actually under immense pressure and paradox navigation has been coming back as a term for uh, during every hour virtual events we've been running how to deal with long term versus short term top down bottom up freedom at work and have enough control and now especially when in the work from home era that's a new skill and a new new situation companies had to deal with so how do you suggest for top leaders in organizations to effectively uh, deal with such ambiguity and effectively navigate such paradoxes um, so I think at a, at a top leadership position, there are a couple of um, people that are probably way more well positioned to tell you the answer to this than me, and that would be John Kay and Roger Martin. Um, so I think Roger Martin has been ranked as sort of the number one thinker in the world for Pinky's 50. Um, and so they both basically talk about the challenges of linear business versus non-linear business. Uh, and the linear business is the shareholder value uh, business philosophy, is that you do business to create shareholder value and you that's your one target. How does this create shareholder value? And both of them attack that as, as, as um, a sort of a, a, a nonsensical way to do business and to, and to lead now. Uh, and so Roger Martin says, well, one of, the, one of the big challenges is we have a real, we have a real market and we have an imaginary market and we actually the real market is what creates lots and lots of value but it's the game market so his book is is around the game market and how you play the, the wall street game uh, and how we're having to respond to wall street expectations of performance to to actually uh, create create the growth but, but Kay's work is more interesting so he talks about obliquity so the idea that to create shareholder value you have to focus on other things um, and he, he gives a whole bunch of examples of, of, of what that looks like. So he, a lot of his examples are uh, his, his two main examples of how focusing on shareholder value destroys a company uh, was, were Boeing and ICI. So Boeing obviously is in the news again at, at the moment for, for different reasons and perhaps none of their leaders have read Kay's work. But Kay sort of illustrates how they went from being the most dominant uh, company in their industry because they focused on on the engineering and and, and built and just the passion of building airplanes and etc to creating shareholder value and actually airbus uh, overtook them when they started doing that and when ici started focusing on shareholder value they collapsed I and mean, they don't exist anymore whereas previously they were just about creating uh, the best products for their customers so martin then argues that that what's actually happened really in the last 20 years is companies that have moved away from shareholder value and focused on customer delight are the ones that have created the, created the most value so they don't actually look at the shareholder value they look at how do we delight our customers how do we how do we grow our market by doing that kind of that kind of work 
Uh, and he, he, so he argues that your, your Amazons and your IBM and your um, Apples and your uh, Googles, they, they're focusing on that and they're trying to delight like their customers. So I don't think that's enough as, as the way the world is now. I think we have to focus on community critique. So if you're thinking about uh, sort of the paradox of the global and the local and the freedom and control and that and top and bottom, you're actually talking about the wider community, all the stakeholders in your organization, all the relationships that they have internally. And you're trying to hear them. You're trying to, to listen to what everybody's saying. So when I say critique, I don't mean criticism. I mean what everybody is thinking about the experience of being in your organization what everybody is thinking about how they contribute, where the bad things are and where the good things are. And you have to start hearing that because if it becomes negative, that impacts your organization far more than the positive. Um, and so you know, as we're going through a very, very negative period of time, and what, because the world is very transparent in, in the digital realm, bad stories spread really, really fast. So I think what you have to do to sort of begin to manage these paradoxes is first of all, you have to learn how to hear what everybody is saying. Um, so listen to your wider community. So that could be stakeholders, that could be your, your board members, your shareholders, your employees, your customers, people as part of your supply chain. They're all part of the, the, the community that you need to hear. And then you have to create something which I'm calling liminal practice. So your, your, both doing traditional work and innovative work simultaneously. And you have to work out how to cost that up and communicate that to the market. So you talked, in the, we initially talked about black swans. So I think the, the, the important thing then is to go to Taleb's work. So Taleb talks about barbell strategies when investing, that you spend 80% of your time doing something ultra conservative and 20% do it of your money doing something ultra radical. And it's balancing those two things. So 80% of what you're doing is ultra conservative. It's the business as usual stuff. It's um, how do we exploit the known market? But then you have to be ultra radical on the other side. And you have to be able to communicate the two of those to the market and fund them. And so there's a whole bunch of interesting work about how to communicate what you're doing well to the market so that you don't end up... Um, you don't have Wall Street saying we don't understand what you're doing and, and therefore we're, we're going to start selling your shares because we, we don't understand the process. So it's around those kind of ideas at a, at a really high level leadership strategy space to, to, to cope with the fact that the paradox is doing two different things simultaneously, uh, exploiting and exploring, and perhaps even um, beginning to explore how you exploit. So, so rather than being an ambidextrous organization, almost a tridextrous organization, because you're also exploring uh, different ways to exploit the main market, which is, which is a quite difficult thing to do. Absolutely brilliant. In fact, what I meant to ask, if you could bring a few examples of uh, some, you mentioned, but you mentioned Airbus, and we talked about corporate ambidexterity, but now you mentioned it's not really ambidexterity, it's a tridexterity. So what, mm. can you explore a little bit further on, on this thought? And if you could bring a few examples of, of leading corporations who are really managing this triangle effectively. Um, so you've got a few where, I mean, higher in, in, out, of, out of China, uh, where, where they, they are ultra radical in their practice, but also sort of really quite conservative in their overall growth uh, are doing both. So they've, 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 um, so they have all these sort of internal startup and things doing the radical innovation, but their overall narrative is, is, is very, very coherent and, and very conservative and it's all around growth, et cetera. So, th so they would be one. Um, I mean, you've got, if you sort of really look at what the, the big tech companies are doing, lots of them are doing that. So I think we we'll use Google as an example. I know it's cliche, but, but it is quite an interesting example. So on one hand, Google is exploiting uh, a, a very, very known market, which is the search engine market, and they're getting all the advertising and it, it allows them to print money. On the other hand, they're being incredibly innovative in terms of trying to create new, new ways of making more money. Um, and the interesting way they do it, so they talk about the 80-20 rule as well, which is the 80-20 barbell strategy. Um, so they basically claim publicly that 
20 you know, 20% of an employee's time is allowed to work on passion projects that that you know might become something it doesn't quite work that way what what actually happens is if some one of the employees has an ultra radical idea um, they can try and create a wireframe or a, a, an archetype of, of, of that a prototype sorry of that idea and then they try and sell it to other employees so if they can actually persuade other employees that um, this is a really good idea, maybe they get a small team of a few people working, you know, maybe three people are working on this, taking it to the next stage. Then they can persuade other people. Maybe then you get to a team working one day a week on it. And then over time that might mature to a, uh, a, a, a product that goes into the market. So there's, a, there's an interesting process there and it actually aligns very, very closely with Chip Mensah Haley's theory of creativity, where you, you have to persuade peers and experts that, that this is a, a creative value adding product that will do something in the market. And they do that at an experimental level. And they don't really talk about it other than saying that their claim that it's 80-20 mm -hmm. until it bubbles up. So it's doing something like that. And it could literally be allowing three person teams to, to spend half a day on something um, or, or the, the, the post-work passion product, you know, give them some beers and a pizza and let them spend a few extra hours in the evening doing this kind of stuff. And then just communicating with them as to what's going on and, and, and looking at where it might go. So I think that's what it looks like in practice. Uh, Google is the easiest one to follow because people have written about it and people talk about it. Uh, and so that it's publicly accessible, the actual process that, that they go through. You've mentioned uh, how important it is to focus on uh, external stakeholders, focus on a, a bigger community, focus on the customer. Uh, what's interesting when uh, Richard Branson, obviously it requires no interaction, the, the chairman CEO of Virgin uh, Group, he says, uh, take care of your people, they will take care of your business. The uh, same way Vinit Nayar, uh, his best-selling book, he was when actually Vinit made an, on Thinkers 50 on that year when he, the book came out, employees first, customers second. So there's a lot of, while you have this external focus on the on a greater community, of course it's vital that uh, an organization as it is does not exist. People, the community of people make an organization. So we've got to focus on people. And that brings me to the next question. On, on the role of mid-managers, we talked about strategic leadership and, and, and the chiefs of the organization, top team. But mid-managers are under immense pressure. Many, many research confirms that they are under, under most stress because they are being pressured from both from uh, top down and bottom up. And while ideally uh, uh, their, their job should be aligning uh, the organization go goals together with the goals of the individual, in the reality, it's, it's more hard than that. Uh, we had uh, a conference last week, the Digital Age HR Innovation Week, and one of the questions was to the, to the audience is about, are your managers able to deliver on the promise of superior employee experience? And over 50% of responses said, no, they are not. But in my view, it's not because they don't want to. Uh, managers are good people, goodwill people. Very often they dysfunction their people, but not because of of, of bad, bad will or it's not their intention. It's just simply being under too much pressure of delivering on both the long-term growth of the organization or long-term promise of the organization, as well as fulfilling individual needs, while of course fulfilling their own needs as well as, as human beings. So that's, that's a massive paradox to navigate. So what do you suggest how mid-managers should approach this question of paradox navigation in their life? So, I mean, I think first of all, we'll just look at what we mean by employee experience. So basically, this is just treating the employee as an internal customer of the organization. Why, why would you work, continue to work for me? What, what actually is the value you get from, so at a customer level, what's the value you get from, from dealing with me? And so you just, you just switched all of that thinking in, into the, the employee level. So the employee is an internal customer, and then therefore that's part of that wider community. So because of the transparency of, of um, information now, and you get sites like Glassdoor where somebody having a terrible employee experience internally can actually write it up and, and, and everyone can read it. So, so the, 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 within that, as that discourse becomes more and more common, the risk is if you get the reputation for being dysfunctional and toxic, it, it's not just you're losing your current employees and it's, and it's shit to work there, 
but you don't get the next generation of digital talent. And that's going to really harm organizations because all organizations are becoming more and more digital. So you, you know, there's a skill based thing here. And I think that sort of takes me to the next point, which is around the cultural forms. So I actually think there's a division here now between different types of culture form. There's the popular way of understanding culture, which is the whole values based you know, create your six or seven values and find people who fit those values and, then, and, and that's going to be fine. And, and executives, uh, and this sort of, I think, came largely out of Jim Collins' work, sort of um, good to great, that, that he sort of really sold this idea as, as long as people live your values, that, that causes the organisation to, to perform. That's the key element. Um, but you've got a whole bunch of work um, Around, around culture that's come out of MIT from, from Edgar Schein and, and um, Gideon Kunder and people like this. And they sort of identified a cultural form in digital, a digital company. So, so um, DEC was the company that they, con it doesn't exist anymore. But, and they argued that a, a digital style culture in DEC had, had these following um, components, creativity, freedom, responsibility, openness, commitment to truth and having fun. And that because DEC was such a major player in the digital world, historically, a whole bunch of people who left DEC then went into Silicon Valley and the other companies. And that kind of culture is still engineering and digital culture. So when you're a company that's becoming more and more digital and you're hiring more and more people who are aligned with that way of thinking, and you're actually got a different set way of doing things in a different set of values. That's where the disjunction happens because this has been going on for 70 years almost. That was when the, the, these kind of ideas came out and you're, you're making people who want to work that way. And that's what they think a great employee experience looks like. And you're making them work in a way that is uh, a, a sort of adherence to a finance institution or, or a bureaucracy and, and, it doesn't match. So it, it, that's the disconnect and, and, and dysfunction. Uh, and then you're going to have the digital natives saying that's not how good work should be done. And then you've got to get the middle management role when they're, they're, cause they're dealing with the top saying, okay, we got, we work this way. And then the bottom saying, no, we want to work this way. And they're stuck in the middle. So of course they can't deliver a great employee experience if they're not any good. You know, they, they, they're, they're actually breaking down under these, these two combined pressures and lots of people would. I mean, there, there's no shame in that, that you, you, you're dealing with two extreme pressures. Um, but a great middle manager really plays, I think, two roles. So they absorb the pressures and they reinterpret what both groups are saying. So I know some good coaches who actually train middle managers to do this. Um, so, so they actually make, so when, when the top down stuff comes, they absorb it, they reinterpret it, and then they tell their team. And when the team says, we need to do this, they absorb it, they reinterpret it. And then they, they, they move, they move it back up the chain of command and say, we're doing this. And it very often that absorption and reinterpreting is about how do I, how do I reinterpret the values of my team? So they match the values at the top. So that it sounds like we're all, all aligned. So that, I think that's what a really great middle manager does. Um, and I, I think one of the big challenges is organizations become more agile uh, or, or I mean, agile, agile is a trendy word. I would just say post-industrial and flat. Um, as that happens, the middle management gets taken out and you lose this absorption and reinterpretation, which is gonna start causing more and more disconnect and more and more dysfunction and perhaps a worse employee experience. So what a great middle manager looks like. I think that you know, you, there are three unhealthy things that happen under these kind of processes that a middle manager can go through. One is that they, they just become a zealot for one side or the other. So they overly protect the team, they're a zealot for the team, or they overly protect the leadership and they're a zealot for the leadership. And that does nobody any good and it actually causes them emotional harm. Two is they become confused. They, they've got too many signals coming at them and they, they actually feel cognitively overwhelmed. Or three, they become emotionally exhausted. They can't cope with all of these various different emotions and passions coming at them from various angles. So that, that's sort of unhealthy reactions. The healthy reactions, and I say healthy in terms of, some of them just protect the manager. But on one level, you've got sort of games playing or Machiavellianism, 
that they just recognize it's a power game and they work out where the power and money is and they try and negotiate and protect their team by knowing where that's going on and, and then maybe getting promoted by being aligned with the right people. Uh, secondly, you've got the idea of role acting. They just learn what the audience expects um, and do that. And, and that's fine as well. So when I've got this audience in front of me, I, I behave like this. And when I've got that one, I behave like that. And I, I toggle between those two expectations without any um, psychological stress. And the one I'm most interested in, which I think uh, the really great middle manager does, is, is have the sense of irony in that actually they, they recognize the rhetoric and reality will never, will never ever mesh. And they enjoy that absurdity, so they don't get frustrated and stressed by it. They play around with it and they actually enjoy the reinterpretation and the protecting the team. And, 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 and it's a playful experience for them. Now, I don't think enough get there. But I also think if you followed some of the, the adult development leadership stuff, they talk about irony being the highest level of leadership. So if you can find them, you've also got your future leaders. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you've got you to basically have this sort of self-awareness and in a way mindfulness that you control what you can control. And if you cannot control, just... Just let it go and, and <laughs> laugh, laugh and learn to laugh. Well. Yeah. Like, laugh <laughs> have a laugh and let it go. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, you mentioned culture, and it's quite quite interesting how when we look at culture. I, I had a chat with Dave Urich the other day. We talked about culture and what he said, and he's got a very interesting view in terms of when we transforming culture or creating culture for the future. You know, many companies are under some sort of a culture transformation. Everybody sort of looks at looks at the history, looks at our values, look at it, kind of have an internal focus. But really smart organizations and organizations we sort of admire. You mentioned Google, you mentioned Apple potentially. Companies are actually starting culture transformation, having sort of an outside in approach to culture as well, looking at how do we want to be seen by the customer? What do we want to what do we want to communicate with our culture in the eyes of the customer? Because at the end of the day, if there are no customers, there's no organization. So starting this, having this outside in approach to even culture transformation and looking at culture in that way, how do we want to be seen by the marketplace and then align the organization internally towards that sort of a long-term goal that's, that's, that's kind of uh, ensures a longer term, longer term success. But here's another paradox in terms of navigating the roots and our core values and also navigating the long term how do we want to be seen by the customer like Nokia went through from a rubber boots company becoming a leading telecommunication company and practically completely disappear in a very short period of time so here's the paradox navigation question to you which was not discussed before so that's why it's called a hard to get <laughs> putting you in a hot seat how do we manage the culture paradox in terms of looking at our long-term heritage, internal values versus, versus long-term growth uh, being seen by the customer in the marketplace? The um, so, so, I mean, again, I, I, I will take the ironic approach because I think that's the best way to handle it. That, that there is inevitably going to be a gap between the rhetoric and reality. Um, and, and actually, the, the rhetoric that goes to the, to the public is not the reality. That's, that's a massaged version of the reality. And it's fine that that's aspirational and you don't ever quite achieve it, but be aware of the gap always. Because okay? the gap is, the, as the gap is inevitable, then work out how to live in the gap and, and what, what the dynamics of the gap look like. So whilst you can have a, a image of your culture that the market loves, um, that's fine but don't for a second think it matches the reality of working in your organization because that will always be contested and there's nothing you can do about it. And you're not ever going to get your, you're not ever going to get the aspirations to a point of achievement and that's fine. Um, but, but be aware that's fine and be aware that all kinds of interesting things happen in the, the, the dynamics and the dimensions of the gap as you're trying to go through this process. So mind the gap. <laughs> Absolutely, mind the gap, yes. <laughs> Last but not least, let's turn to, of course, most of our listeners and viewers are HR leaders and HR has got a fundamental role being an architect in the organization. So how do you suggest HR should support the organization to successfully navigate and, and manage paradoxes exist at individual manager leadership level? 
oh, they've got they've got so much to do. So so first of all, um, I mean, I hate. I think they 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 should, stage one just get rid of the term HR. You're doing something different. Um, it, it's not about human resources. It's it's about organisational behaviour and development, and and it's so it's more than just about uh, humans as a resource. So I think there's there's sort of two answers. So it's quite a long answer to this question, but I, I, I'll do the best I can quickly. So I think, first of all, you have to accept that because of this, this gap is, this cultural gap is pretty much everywhere. Uh, and because of the way the world is trending, we actually have um, a, a bunch of dirty realities that we don't talk about that, that exist in most workplaces. Uh, one is distrust. People don't trust each other and they don't trust leaders and, and, and um, leaders don't trust the team and you know, all of that, that, that. There's a huge amount of evidence that we're, we're at a record level of distrust. So you've then got disease. So the Jeffrey Pfeffer's idea that organisations are making us physiologically and psychologically ill um, because of the, 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 the tensions and the pressures. You've got drag, which is the industrial form of work, dragging post-industrial organisations backwards. So too much bureaucracy or too many business as usual meetings, et cetera, et cetera. You've got drama, which is impression, basically impression management. I, I'm pretending to be something I'm not. Uh, and then distraction. Um, I've got all this technology bleeping at me all the time. You know, so you, you, this, this, this is the, the actual reality for lots of people in organisations today. So first of all, accept that. And the outputs of that is the toxicity and disengagement that lots of organisations are struggling with, which are harming the employee experience. So different degrees for different organisations, but, but the same thing is sort of going on. So that's sort of the dirty realities we, we need to accept. We then need to accept as well that actually there are five components of good knowledge work. Um, so there's deep, collaborative, connection, learning and shallow. So deep is just the focus work where I'm sitting in front of my computer focusing on one piece of work collaborative i'm in a room with people trying to solve a complex problem connection i'm having coffee or a beer with someone or uh, or lunch and we're having interesting conversations flirting around the edges of work learning uh, is obviously development how do you how do you develop how do you share you can shadow you can mentor you can be coached you can watch stuff you can talk about stuff and shallow which is all the admin and et cetera, et cetera, that, and, and emails and, and text messages and Slack channels and all of the things that are coming at us all the time. And unfortunately that's expanding to, to fill people's day. Right? That more and more, 80% of people's day is shallow work. So of course performance is, 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 a, is a problem. So we, I think we need to reimagine performance at one level at HR. How do we do more of that? How do we actually construct work so that Front and the, the, first of all, we try and get rid of the dirty realities, and secondary, we try and make these these four components of work front and foremost. Um, and I think that's a lot of it's getting you know, you're getting rid of the drama, you're getting rid of the distraction. You're going to like, now we can focus, now we can collaborate, etc. Um, and that sort of means you're sort of going away from production and presenteeism, and 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 you're reimagining performance and. and um, understanding that people working doesn't necessarily look like how it used to look 10 years ago or even 20 years ago and there's a whole bunch of other stuff and I think we're experiencing that as more and more people are working from home that actually some people are getting way more done because they, they're given a bit more freedom and flexibility to do the work in a way they do so that, that for me is sort of stage one and then stage two is so once you're sort of beginning to get there um, it's going to give people a sense of coherence in the work they do, right? They actually understand that they've got this control, they've got the coherence of the work that they're doing, um, and that gives them a sense of purpose. They see the value of all, they see how productive they are, they see that their knowledge is being trusted and they're, they're, communic they're, they're allowed to, 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 to work in a way that suits them and they're actually being trusted to deliver. And that gives you a sense of coherence. You get the sort of the joy and the bliss and the wellness and all the things that we're worried about because you've got the sense of coherence. And then you get a sense of purpose. I see the value of my work rather than, oh, I'm working for an organization that has a, a, a CSR project that I sort of seem to align with. You get purpose because you get coherence and because you've got coherence, you're feeling well. So that's sort of one element is that, okay, let's not confuse purpose and coherence. Let's put, coherence first 
Mm -hmm. uh, coherence throughout all everything you do at work, and then purpose comes. And then secondly, we're gonna we're gonna have to reimagine leadership a little bit as a quality of a team rather than the quality of an individual. So that leadership is an, is a is a verb and an activity that moves around a team. So even the people who are not necessarily in a formal leadership position will take leadership of different elements of the work because that's what they're good at. So that you know you're beginning to look at, at, at that as a as, as a different way of imagining leadership. Uh, it's going to take a while to get there because it's not the standard. Um, but but we're really going to try and do that. So HR themselves. Um, because unfortunately organizations are designed around the production presentium is model HR just get dumped the people stuff on them. It's like, right, here's, here's the people, here's all the challenges, deal with it. Uh, and, and some HR people sort of collude with the model and focus on the transactional level. So they don't even do the deep collaborative connection and learning work. No. Um, they just do the transactional shallow stuff. So they need to look at uh, how do we actually do systemic interventions to improve and sustain the performance and the well-being of the organization. So you're moving out, even though they're talking about people, they're actually talking about systemic interventions to try and make, uh, to get rid of the dirty realities and, and, and create these good dimensions of work. Now, if they do that, um, there's a huge amount of research that suggests that the, the qualities of future work so the sort of the, the creativity and the critical thinking and the collaboration and the cognitive flexibility, um, they're going to thrive. Okay, you're getting rid of all of the stuff that stops that. And then performance is, go, is going to go up. At the same time you get rid of all of this, well-being starts to go up. So not only are you creating a better bottom line, you're creating a healthier employee base, and then your community um, the chat becomes more and more stronger because then, then you're going to get the next generation of employees. Mm. So I think the organizations that get this right, uh, they're going to attract the best and retain the best people. They're also going to reduce a huge number of costs related to the dirty realities. They all have bottom line costs. We won't go into them, but it's a lot. Uh, I think drag Gary Hamill suggests is $3 trillion in the US economy per annum, 9 million, 9 trillion across the OECD. So you can, you sort of got a real bottom line source and then you've got a workforce that can also contribute to this 80, 20 and, and try dexterity. How do we do the radical reinvention of work that puts us in the right place in the future? Mm -hmm. So that's where I want HR to go, but it requires a radical reimagining of, of the role so that they, they avoid all the transactional stuff and they start doing systemic interventions. They're brilliant, Richard. And of course, ho hopefully now technology is maturing slowly, but surely that they can help to take away some of these transactional pressures. One thing caught my attention, you mentioned coherence first and then purpose second. Yes. Uh, are, we, are we questioning the why? Oh God, yes. <laughs> um, Simon Sinek was made famous because it started with why, and now you're saying that, okay, well, Simon, let's just rethink this. Let's start coherence first and then add purpose. You, you could argue that coherence, yeah, so you start with coherence. So this, this, is, this is really a coherent sense of, of, of what I'm doing, um, how I'm doing it, and then why I'm doing it. So, so they all, in, it's not like you can separate the three. They're all internal. What we don't want is the why to be an external institutional greater good purpose. That has some of the most horrific um, things related to it. Um, you know, there's so much research because if you, if you think you're working for the greater good, that this is external institutional purpose that you're working towards, you can justify the worst toxicity to other people because you're working for a greater good. So the purpose has to come out of the sense of coherence, which is not just a why, it's a what, a how, and a why of, of the work itself. And then you can say, yeah, then maybe Seneca's is right, that you can actually say the why is, is how you need to talk about it, but it's only how you need to talk about it rather than what it starts with. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Richard. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a blast. If people want to reach out to you, what's the, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, just go through my LinkedIn profile. If you if you throw that somewhere, that's the easiest way. Um, rather than email, I, I respond rather rapidly normally. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Heart Talk HR. If you do, and if you have, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We'll be back with more episodes soon. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe.